Chapter 368 A Muslim Girl in the West, Section 21 The Producer, Thank You Our Blessed Sheikh Dr. Ibtihal, you have heard the protest of our guest speaker in the studio here Al-Sheikh Abu Jihad. He said you should have answered those questions that I have put before you in the beginning of this program and then you could have the right to speak against Islam. You just jumped directly into the Quran and the Hadiths, and quoted them right and left and you were not even honest in your quotations. You have not told the viewers the interpretations of those gracious verses. You have not told who explained to you those Hadiths. You have been once a Muslim woman as you claimed and you know Islam put restrictions on talking about the Quran and the Hadiths. Once again, I would like to remind you, engage yourself in those urgent questions that everyone is trying to answer today. Dr. Ibtihal, first of all I have been told that the debate is about terrorism in Islam. I have here with me the official invitation that I have received from you and it says that the topic of the debate is, I am quoting your letter, is Islam the religion of terror? I am surprised when you began to ask those questions at the beginning of the program. If I have to engage myself in those questions then the debate would turn into West versus East, Islam versus Christianity, politics versus religion, America versus Saddam Hussein, etc. The main question before us in this debate as I have been told, do the Quran and the Hadith encourage terrorism? Or is Islam the religion of terror? The guest speaker spoke to me as if I am not an Arab or I have never understood the simple meanings of those verses and hadiths I quoted. Why should I need an interpreter or commentator to tell me the word fight means fight? What is not clear to the viewers about the hadith in which the Prophet Muhammad has said, I have been commanded to fight all people until they bear witness that there is no God except Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah if they say it they uphold from me their wealth and blood. Even a person who has never been to school can understand the meaning of this hadith. Why should I need Al-Sheikh Al-Albani to explain to me the meaning of this hadith? The guest speaker and you have accused me of dishonesty in my quotations of the Quran and the hadiths. None of you did pinpoint to me where I have been dishonest in my quotations. Do you mean by that I have not pronounced those verses correctly or I chopped some parts and added some parts from my own mind? I have given the exact name of the Sora and the verse number. I have mentioned the source from which I quoted each hadith. If those sources are not acceptable to the guest speaker and to you that would be another question. I don't want to make these objections as an excuse to terminate the debate. I am well prepared to engage those questions you asked. I am also ready to quote the interpretations of those verses from the well-known commentators of the Quran such as Ibn Kathir, Al-Qurtobi, and Al-Tabari. And I do believe that would strengthen my arguments rather than weaken them. First, I would begin with those questions you asked in the beginning of the program. You asked who sent the Crusaders to Palestine and murdered millions of innocent Arab Muslims. First of all, the Lord Jesus Christ teaches in his gospel loves your enemies. Those who sent the crusaders acted on their own accord. Secondly, how did the Muslim Arabs end into Palestine? Was not at the time of the Caliph Omar ibn al-Khattab that the Muslim Mujahideen invaded the holy land of the Jews and Christians? Why did Omar ibn al-Khattab who was known as the most just judge that ever existed after Muhammad have forced the Jews and Christians of Levant or al-Sham to make the following promises? And here I am going to refer to the interpreter ibn Kathir commenting on Surah al tawbah 9, 29. And these conditions will show how Muslims were mean and cruel towards the defeated Christians. Ibn Kathir said these are the conditions that Omar Ibn al-Khattab forced on the Christians in order to humiliate and abuse them because they refused to accept the message of their master our Prophet Muhammad peace and prayers be upon him. I am going to quote all those unfair conditions that Omar made the people of the book to accept against their wishes. One we shall not build, in our cities or in their neighborhood, new monasteries, churches, convents or monks' cells, nor shall we repair by day or by night, such of them as fall in ruins or are situated in the quarters of the Muslims. 
Why do you want to build your mosques in America and Europe and forbid Christians to build churches in Saudi Arabia and many Muslim countries? According to your Al Jazeera TV, there are 2,000 mosques in Paris. Imagine there is such a big number of mosques in one single city in France while there is not a single Christian church in Saudi Arabia. There is not a single city in Europe, America, Australia, and Canada that has no mosque in it. 2. We shall keep our gates wide open for passers-by and travellers. We shall give board and lodging to all Muslims who pass our way for three days. 3. We shall not give shelter in our churches or in our dwellings to any spy, nor hide him from the Muslims. 4. We shall not teach the Quran to our children. 5. We shall not manifest our religion publicly nor convert anyone to it. We shall not prevent any of our kin from entering Islam if they wish it. Why do you forbid Christians to preach their gospel and deny them the right to convert people to their religion while you invite non-Muslims to accept Islam? Why are you always one-sided? Why Islam allows Muslim men to marry Christian women while forbids Christian men to marry Muslim women? Why do you kill the Muslim who forsakes Islam and becomes Christian? Why do you kill the apostate and reward financially the one who forsakes Christianity and becomes Muslim? 6. We shall show respect toward the Muslims, and we shall rise from our seats when they wish to sit. Have you or Al-Sheikh Abu Jihad ask yourself why the Christians have to stand on their feet and give their seats to Muslims? Of course, the answer because as Ibn Kathir has said it to humiliate and abuse them because they refused to accept the message of Muhammad. As we shall see below, the Caliph Omar forbade Christians to ride a horse or a donkey with a saddle. Moreover, he ordered every Christian to shave the front of his head. The caliphs of Baghdad following the example of Omar had ordered every Jewish woman to wear one red shoe in one foot and in her other foot a yellow shoe. In addition, every Jewish woman and Christian woman have to fasten a bell on her body. The Prophet Muhammad said to his followers, when you meet a Jew or a Christian on the road don't start greeting him and make it difficult for him to walk. 7. We shall not seek to resemble the Muslims by imitating any of their garments, the kalansawa, the turban, footwear, or the parting of the hair. We shall not speak as they do, nor shall we adopt their kunyas or last names. 8. We shall not mount on saddles, nor shall we gird swords nor bear any kind of arms nor carry them on our persons. Why did Omar force Christians to ride their horses and donkeys without saddles, and why did he disarm them? 9. We shall not engrave Arabic inscriptions on our seals. 10. We shall not sell fermented drinks. 11. We shall clip the fronts of our heads. This is what I have mentioned. He wanted to dehumanize them and make them a laughing stock. 12. We shall always dress in the same way wherever we may be, and we shall bind the zinner round our waists. The zinner is the same as the badge of shame that the Jews were forced to wear in Europe by the anti Semites. 13. We shall not display our crosses or our books in the roads or markets of the Muslims. We shall use only clappers in our churches very softly. We shall not raise our voices when following our dead. We shall not show lights on any of the roads of the Muslims or in their markets. We shall not bury our dead near the Muslims. 14. We shall not take slaves who have been allotted to Muslims. 15. We shall not build houses overtopping the houses of the Muslims. 16. When I brought the letter to Umar, may God be pleased with him, he added, we shall not strike a Muslim. 17. We accept these conditions for ourselves and for the people of our community, and in return we receive safe conduct. 18. If we in any way violate these undertakings for which we ourselves stand surety, we forfeit our covenant, and we become liable to the penalties for contumacy and sedition. 19. Umar ibn al-Khattab replied, Sign what they ask, but add two clauses and impose them in addition to those, which they have undertaken. They are, they shall not buy anyone made prisoner by the Muslims, and whoever strikes a Muslim with deliberate intent shall forfeit the protection of this pact, Tafsir ibn Kathir to Surat al tawbah 9, 29. I think I have given a satisfactory answer to the first question that you asked. 
Regarding your questions about the Second World War and the nuclear bombs that hit Japan, I am not an expert in world's politics to answer those questions. However, as far as my knowledge is concerned, America retaliated the attack that Japanese planes carried against their military base in Pearl Harbor. The Second World War was a fight between many European countries, which led by the two rivals, Britain and Germany. It was not different from the many massacres that Muslim leaders fought against each other during wars of apostasy between Abu Bakr's army and the Arab apostates, Aisha's army against Ali's fighters, Ali's troops against Muawiyah's Mujahideen fighters, and throughout the history of Islam until the Turks against the Arabs, and Mongols against the Arabs and Turks. At the time of the Caliph Yazid ibn Muawiyah the Muslim troops invaded Mecca and destroyed the Black Kaaba, the house of their Allah by the catapults and raped thousands of young Muslim girls. The Muslim historians ibn Saad, al-Tabari and al-Waqadai narrated that the soldiers of Yazid ibn Muawiyah broke 1,000 Muslim girls' hymens in one single day. The Second World War and many European wars were more political in nature than religious. You have mentioned incorrect statement about the Red Indians in America and Canada. Who told you that the white men wiped the Red Indians from existence and made them extinct? This is not correct statement and cannot be supported by any factual proofs. There are thousands of Red Indians in America and Canada until today. They don't call them Red Indians anymore. They are known as First Nations, Métis and Inuits. You have asked me. Who invaded the other. Britain invaded Egypt or Egypt invaded Britain. I don't understand what you want to conclude by asking this question. Do you want to say because some Western countries colonized some Muslim countries in the 19th century that the Muslim Mujahideen were justified in the 7th century to invade other countries and force them to accept their religion by the sword? Do you know what Muslims did to us in Sudan when they invaded our country at the time of the Third Caliph Osman ibn Affan? Have you ever heard about the Treaty of al bughad The Muslim leader Abdullah ibn Abi al-Sarh forced the Sudanese Christian Kingdom of Alway to make a treaty with him in which the latter should give every year 360 slaves to the Muslim Arabs. This treaty was signed after the Muslim Mujahideen destroyed by the catapults the biggest church in Dongola Alajosa the capital of the Kingdom of Alway. Why do you talk about invasion when invasion and holy war is one of the pillars of Islam, which is called Jihad in the way of Allah? Jesus never commanded the Christians to go and invade or colonize any other country. Muhammad commanded his followers to invade Tabuk in order to capture the daughters of the white men and the women of the Romans. He used loot and women as incentives to entice his ruthless Mujahideen to carry out their bloody invasions. While Osama bin Zayd was preparing his troops to invade the Roman lands, the Prophet Muhammad commanded him saying, attack them in the darkness of the dawn and fall on them killing and burn them with fire and invade them and return with the booty. Are these the words of the Prophet of God or the Messenger of Satan? What is your source, shouted al-Sheikh Abu Jihad angrily, you are a liar. You put words in the mouth of our gracious Prophet Muhammad that he had never ever say. Shut the mouth of this accursed woman. Okay our blessed Sheikh, please calm down and refrain from using personal insult, said the producer. He then turned to Dr. Ibtihal and lifted his finger up pointing it straight into the big screen where Dr. Ibtihal was sitting calmly and waiting for the commotion to subside. You have no right to utter a single word about our gracious Prophet Muhammad, may peace and prayers of Allah be upon him, without giving a reliable and approved Islamic source for it. Dr. Ibtihal smiled and closed her eyes. Then, she opened them and said calmly, How many sources do you want? Two, three, four, or more. At least give us one reliable Islamic source. I am going to be very generous and give you a half dozen of reliable Islamic sources for this quotation. Please write down these sources. 1 IBN Habib in Al Mahabur, page 117. 2 IBN Kathir in Al Badaya and Al Nahaya, pages 139 and 143. 3 IBN Said Al Nas in Oren Al Atharig, page 145. 
4 Al Suli in Rod Al Anif, page 24. 5 Ibn Hisham, page 245. And 6 Al Tabari in Tariq Al Rusul and Al Miluk, page 156. Are these reliable and approved Islamic sources to the Blessed Sheikh or does he has objection against them? The producer looked at Al Sheikh Abu Jihad and waited for an answer to the question of Dr. Ibtihal. When the Blessed Sheikh did not utter a word the producer turned to Dr. Ibtihal and said, You have only one and a half minutes left now. Do you want to say anything in this short time or should we turn the microphone to the other guest speaker? I am giving those fractions of my ten minutes to our Blessed Sheikh to respond to my second speech. Al Sheikh Abu Jihad frowned and then shouted, First of all I want to know whether this woman is atheist, apostate, secularist, feminist, or communist. What religion does she follow now? Producer, okay our Blessed Sheikh I won't count your time until the guest speaker answer this question. Dr. Ibtihal Although this question is irrelevant to our present debate still I will answer it. I was born and brought up as a Muslim girl. My father, Al-Sheikh Hajj Taha is a graduate of Al-Azhar Al-Sharif University. So, he graduated from the same university Al-Sheikh Abu Jihad graduated and at present he is one of its professors. My father has double bachelor's and double master's degrees from Al-Azhar University in Islamic Studies. Besides that, he obtained his doctorate in the Sharia law from the same university. After he returned to Sudan, he was offered the position of the Grand Mufti of Sudan but he declined and became the Imam of the Grand Mosque in al Ghadarif city. As for me, I am a medical doctor by profession but I have read and mastered hundreds of Islamic books that my father brought with him from Egypt. After I became a medical doctor in the biggest hospital in Khartoum city, I converted to Christianity out of my own free will. Why did you convert? shouted Al Sheikh Abu Jihad. Our blessed Sheikh, interrupted the producer, this is becoming a personal issue which is not the concern of this program. Please let us continue our debate and leave personal questions out of the debate. I am asking her this question because I am very sure she is lying. This woman is a bitter enemy of Islam. I have heard many of her speeches when she was in Europe. She has nothing to say about Islam except lies upon lies. Our blessed Sheikh, interrupted the producer again, I am begging you to leave the personal things aside and return to our debate. This woman said many things about Islam. She accused our Prophet Muhammad prayers and peace of Allah be upon him of being a teacher of terrorism. She repeatedly said Islam teaches its followers to terrorize their enemies. She quoted many verses from the gracious Quran and the blessed Sunnah of our gracious Prophet. It is unfair for the ordinary Muslim viewers to hear such terrible accusations against Islam and not to get satisfactory answers. Please tell the viewers what the Sharia says about those verses. Are they not being abrogated by other verses, which say, there is no compulsion in religion? Is not the Quran also emphatically says, dispute ye not with the people of the book, except with means better, than mere disputation? Dr. Ibtihal smiled and made a slight laughter when she heard the producer was pleading with his sheikh and begging him to refute her words by hook or crook. Al-Sheikh Abu Jihad, this woman has admitted that she is not an Islamic religious scholar. She has never been to any Islamic college. On which basis do you allow her to come here in this Islamic TV channel and give her the chance to attack Islam? The Quran strictly warns us from speaking or listening to such hater of Islam. The Almighty God said in His gracious book, if you hear the words of God being mocked of don't sit with them until they change the topic. Mu'alana Sheikh Abu Jihad, interrupted the producer once again, please let us continue the debate. This woman made serious accusations against Islam. Please, answer the question. Is Islam the religion of terror as this speaker claims? You know our sheikh, 99% of our viewers are Muslims. We can't leave those accusations unanswered like this. Please tell us what is the stand of Islam towards those verses and hadiths she quoted. Al-Sheikh Abu Jihad, Islam is the final heavenly message to the earth. 
Muhammad is the seal of all the messengers and prophets of Allah. Every word in the Quran is the eternal word of God. Islam is mercy to all the worlds. Muhammad came to take people out of the worship of the idols to the worship of the living and only one God. Islam came to correct the corrupted religions of the Jews and the Christians. Muhammad came to guide the deluded Christians who worship Jesus the son of Mary. He was sent to take them from the worship of man to the worship of the only one God. Muhammad is mercy to mankind. Jihad is an obligation to every Muslim man. We Muslims will invade America, Europe, and the entire world. This is the promise of Allah to his beloved prophet Muhammad. God will fulfill his light even if the unbelievers hate it. Our blessed prophet has said, God has given me the whole earth to convert it into mosque. Muslims will build mosques everywhere in the world and pray to Allah. The last hour will not arrive until the Muslims make war against the Jews and kill them, and until a Jew hiding behind a rock and tree, and the rock and tree will say, O servant of Allah, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. This is an authentic hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. We will kick the Americans and the British out of Iraq. We will drive them out of Afghanistan. We will follow them to their lands and defeat them. Allahu Akbar for the unbelievers. We will change the entire world. Islam is the solution to the corruption of the world. It is the solution for every problem in our world today. The world lives in darkness without the message of Muhammad. The Quran has a solution to every problem. It is the book of science and medicine. It is the book of righteousness and holiness. It is the book of life. It is the eternal word of God. God has promised in his book to punish those who rejected the message of our blessed prophet Muhammad. The Almighty Allah has said, in Surat Al-Nisa 3, verse 56. As to those who reject faith, I will punish them with terrible agony in this world and in the hereafter, nor will they have anyone to help. This is our religion and this is the promise of God to us. We will not hide or deny our religion in order to please the West. Al-Sheikh Abu Jihad stopped talking. The producer waited for some time and then said, Our blessed Sheikh Abu Jihad still you have five minutes to finish your words. I have finished my words and I have answered the question of anyone who accuses our Islamic religion as the religion of terror. Muhammad said, I have been sent with the sword between my hands so that no one should be worshipped except Allah. Good, said the producer, now we will turn the microphone to our guest speaker in Chicago, USA. Dr. Ibtihal this is your last ten minutes. You have heard the answers of Al-Sheikh Abu Jihad. Please respond to his answers. First of all I want to answer the question that you put repeatedly before Al-Sheikh Abu Jihad and he did not answer it. I will quote your words exactly the way you put them before the guest speaker. You have said, please tell the viewers what the Sharia says about those verses. Are they not being abrogated by other verses, which say there is no compulsion in religion? Is not the Quran also emphatically says, Dispute ye not with the people of the book, except with means better than mere disputation. Unfortunately, you have said the opposite. Those verses you quoted are abrogated by the verse of the sword in Surat al-Tawbah verse 5 and verse 29. The verse you have quoted from Surat al-Baqarah 2, 256. Let there be no compulsion in religion. The Muslim scholar and commentator, al-Sheikh al-Nisaburai says, this verse has been abrogated by the verse of the sword, al tauba 9, 5. This is in the Nazik and Mansuk, al nisaburai pages 96-97. But when the forbidden months are past, then fight and slay the pagans wherever ye find them, and seize them, beleaguer them, and lie in wait for them in every stratagem, of war, but if they repent, and establish regular prayers and practice regular charity, then open the way for them, for Allah is often forgiving, most merciful, Surat al tauba 9, 5. This is the verse of the sword. al nisabora said further about the verse of the sword, that it was the abrogating verse and it had abrogated 124 verse from the Quran, 
The Nazik and Mansuk, Al Nisaburai, page 284. Ali Abi Talha narrated, Ibn Abbas said, that God orders the Prophet Muhammad to use the sword against anyone whom he made a treaty with until he enters Islam, the Nazik and Mansuk, Al Nisaburai, page 184. The verse of the sword is supported by other verses, in which the Quran clearly declares that God would not accept any religion other than Islam. If anyone desires a religion other than Islam, submission to Allah, never will it be accepted of him, and in the hereafter he will be in the ranks of those who have lost, all spiritual good. Surat Ali Imran 3, 85 Do they seek for other than the religion of Allah, while all creatures in the heavens and on earth have, willing or unwilling, bowed to his will, accepted Islam, and to him shall they all be brought back, Ali Imran 3, 83. The religion before Allah is Islam, submission to his will, Ali Imran 319. The second verse which you quoted about the people of the book, dispute ye not with the people of the book, except with means better, than mere disputation, Surat al Ankapat, 29, 46. Al Sheikh al Nisaburai says, this verse was abrogated by Surat al Tauba 9, 29. The reference is the same page 266. Fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth, from among the people of the book, Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission, and feel themselves subdued. The verse of the sword clearly gives permission to every Muslim to kill any non-Muslim if he refuses to accept Islam. There is an exception made for the Jews and Christians and that if they pay al jitsiyah and lie with those unfair and inhumane Omarian conditions that I quoted in my previous speech. The Prophet said many hadiths to support those verses. I have been granted victory through terrorism. When the Prophet of Islam himself has admitted that he got victory through terrorism, then who among you can deny this fact and contradict the Prophet Muhammad? Either the Prophet had lied or you have lied and denied that Islam is the religion of terror. The Prophet of Islam never hides the fact that he comes to force people to accept his religion by the sword. He has said, I have been sent with the sword between my hands so that no one should be worshipped except Allah. God granted my living under the tip of my spear. I have been commanded to fight the people until they bear witness that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. If they say it they uphold from me their wealth and blood. According to those verses and hadiths it is a compulsory obligation for every believer in Islam today to kill, anyone who rejects the message of Muhammad except the Jews and the Christians. Believers in other religions such as Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Confucianism, Taoism, Shinto, Sikhism, Baha'i Faith, Native American Spirituality, Atheists, Agnostics, all minor religions followers, all indigenous religions adherents, all other various religions devotees, and everyone who does not believe in any religion whatsoever, as long as you are not a Muslim, is supposed to be killed and his wealth, women, children, and property be taken by Muslims if he refuses to accept Muhammad as the final messenger of Allah. Islam divides the world into two areas, Dar al-Islam, the land of Islam, is the area where the Islamic states reigned and the Sharia law is sovereign and Dar el Harb, the land of war. Every country falls outside of Dar al Islam is the war zone for Muslim Mujahideen that they should invade whenever they are ready. Although the Jews and the Christians somehow got exempted from that physical annihilation by the killing Makine of Muslim Mujahideen, if they reject the message of Muhammad, still they have been treated as inferior and satanic races throughout the history of Islam. Muslim Mujahideen had killed 60 million Christians and 80 million Hindus during their invasions of other countries. Historians have estimated that during those bloody battles, 272 million people were killed. Even the Prophet called them the sons of pigs and monkeys. I would like to quote the dialogue between the Prophet of Islam and the frightened Jews of Bani Qurayza. Muhammad, O oh brothers of monkeys and pigs! The trembling Jews replied, O oh Abu al-Qasim, you have not been a bad man. Ibn Kathir, 
al Badaya and al Nihaya, page 120. The Prophet called out to them again, O oh brothers of monkeys and pigs, does Allah disappointed you and sent on you his curse? The Qurayza understood the message and replied in fear, O oh Abu al Qasim, you have not been an ignorant man, al Bihaki, al Tariq, page 582. The Jews of Qurayza continued to plead with Muhammad and beg him to send to them one of their allies, a man by the name of Abi Libaba bin Abdul Nuziar al Awaisi. When Abi Libaba entered their garrison, the men rose, the women wept, and the children cried to him. When he saw them he had pity on them. They said to him, O oh Abi Libaba, do you think we should go out for the judgment of Muhammad? He said, Yes, and then he passed his finger across his neck, which means, the slaughter. Then their leader, Ka'ab bin Asa'ad said to his people, Let us follow Muhammad and believe in him. They replied, we will not leave the judgment of the Torah forever. He said to them, Then let us kill our children and women and go out to Muhammad. They said, Shall we kill these harmless children and women? What is the good of life after them? Al-Tabari page 583 The surrendered Jewish men and young boys were slaughtered in front of the Prophet one after the other. They were nine hundred men. The horrifying slaughter was described by Al-Tabari in these words. They brought first the enemy of Allah, Hwaya bin Akhetab, while his hands were bound to his neck by a rope. When Hwaya saw the messenger of Allah, he said to him, I swear by God, I have never blamed myself for your enmity. Then, Hwaya turned to the people and said, O people there is no fear from the judgment and the book of God it is an honor written by God to the children of Israel to die as martyrs. Then, he sat down and his neck was beheaded. Ali bin Talib and al Zabir continued to strike their necks. It is assumed that their bloods reached the oil stones that are at the market, Al-Tabari, Al-Tarik pages 588 to 589.